This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA, it's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Presented by GSMC Podcast Network. My name is Chris Blades. And before I get started here today, I want to make sure I remind you guys, as always, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast. Please make sure you never miss an episode. Please make sure you're always on top of when we drop our latest stuff. Also, if you could, please as well, give us a five-star rating, rise and ask review. We very appreciate it. Very helpful. I'll see what you guys like, which you guys dislike, the ways we can improve, all that stuff. And lastly, if you're on social media, we're on social media, so you can find us there, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, we can talk, we can chat, we can debate, we can discuss, and boy, do I imagine Drew Brees has had to have a lot of conversations with a lot of different people in the past 24 to 48 hours, give or take, um, depende, if you will, but yeah, so, I mean, Drew Brees, we gotta talk about it. Um, he apparently does not listen to the podcast because as I've been saying throughout this whole, um, throughout this whole time period of ever since the George Floyd murder and since the subsequent riots, protests, well, mainly protests, but protests, riots, looting, whatever you, however you choose to describe it as, I choose protests, but however you choose to describe it as. Since that's been happening, um, we've seen a lot of people speak up and speak out. And I've, and I still hold the belief that while I do appreciate athletes speaking up and speaking out, using their platform to provide awareness, to spread links for a place you can donate, to go fund me, or different um, organizations or, or different things that can help benefit and help combat police brutality and systematic racism that plagues this country and will and what has plagued this country and still plagues this country and probably will continue to play this country for the foreseeable future at least until like i said we get we we um change some things up in society i was telling i was trying to talk it's, it's not necessary because if you don't say the right thing which i mean at this point should be simple especially should have been simple now um after more than a week of this but again if you don't say the right thing you will get rightfully attacked and like I said Drew Brees apparently not listening to the podcast and that is exactly what happened to him so the one thing I will say about Drew Brees is like again up until he issued his apology the other day is that he was at least consistent so back when Colin Kaepernick started the kneeling um for like to, to help bring awareness to police brutality and systematic and institutionalized racism in this country. Um, he, I believe, I don't know exactly, like, whether it was 2016, 2017, the exact timetable of his statement, but I remember back during that time, he was one of the people that was of the belief that, like, he didn't like the protest because, like, it disrespected the flag and, um, and all that foolishness that had the protest and Colin was never trying to force or talk about. He literally chose to take a knee because before he was sitting down and then he talked to Nate Boyer, a Green Beret, um, who said that um, kneeling would be more respectful. So he chose to take a knee. And then, like I said, that um, led down a whole series of events. And and like I said, everybody had a different opinion. It was and the people were on different sides of the fence on this issue. Like I said, people who didn't want to talk about what he was actually talking about always tried to co-opt it and say that it was about the national anthem or it was about the flag, which it never was. But regardless, Drew Brees had these same beliefs then. So um, so he said basically a very similar thing 
on what I think was the Yahoo Finance interview he was doing. He basically said this, a very similar thing to the to, to beliefs he had three or four years ago. So, like I said, at the very least, he was consistent. The issue was that times have changed. And for whatever reason, Drew Brees was not aware of that. So his response, or what he had to say, was not as accepted as it was four years ago, which, I mean, shouldn't have been accepted back then. But regardless, he clearly did not, as people have been saying on social media, read the room and see that, like, hey, you can't, like, now is not the time to say that. Especially when more people are coming around on why it was, in fact, that Colin Kaepernick was kneeling, especially when we're seeing now more videos come out of police brutalizing and attacking citizens of all races, of all um, of all colors, of all genders. Uh, like I said, man, woman, black, white, in between. So, like I said, we do we obviously we have an issue within um, within them going after and brutalizing black individuals, but also we have a bigger overall problem: just police brutalizing everybody. Um, and like I said, as it's become more visible, and I guess not become more visible because it was always visible. I don't know why people didn't believe Colin or other people when they were talking about this before, but now with all the videos of the different protests and you see the way some of the police um, forces are, or law enforcement officers are instigating some of these peaceful protests, you, people are starting to come around like, yeah, all right, maybe Colin was right. I mean, he was always right, but there's more people are starting to come along to his side like, yes, okay, I understand what it was that he was protesting about before. Like I said, apparently, Drew Brees had not been paying attention to those things. So he came out and was basically talking about, I think it was, I think it was some, I forget the exact question, but something along the lines of like, what would happen or how it would feel if a person pe- like peacefully protested during this season, something along those lines, I believe. And then, like I said, he gave a long spiel about not, he would never accept, or he would never be okay with people kneeling during the national anthem because when he sees the flag, it, it reminds him of his grandparents who apparently, like uh, some, I think it was Shannon Sharp pointed this out, which was kind of funny. Like, he acted as if his grandparents were the, or grandfathers were the only two people that fought in one World War II. There were a lot of people that fought alongside those people. There was a lot of black people that fought alongside his grandparents. And then when they came back to the States, were not treated the same way as, the, as their white counterparts, even while in uniform. So you knew that they fought for your country, that you, you knew that they helped win a war for the country, and still they came back to a world that didn't accept them. So, again, not everybody has the same feelings when you see the flag and I think that's what really hurt Drew Brees in the long run was that he co-opted what the message was and put it on himself that's what I'm saying you're seeing a lot now with everything that's going on people are thinking outside of themselves and starting to empathize with the people that are in those situations and the things that you're going through obviously you can never never understand completely what it is to be black well well because he's not black so he, he won't ever fully understand let me say that what it is like, but he can try to talk to people, try to learn things. But then, like I said, when he said that and kind of brought it on to his perspective, as opposed to what it was about, he got attacked from every single direction. I mean, it doesn't matter. It didn't matter. Like if like current players, former players, teammates, current teammates, um, no well, former teammates, like current teammates, uh, people in other sports. It was like I like it. I mean, obviously, he had some supporters here and there, but it seemed like every person that was on, at least on Twitter yesterday, was attacking him. And like I said, or I guess yeah, this was Wednesday. Um, and rightfully so, because his, his comments just weren't, not only were they not necessary, because no one was talking about the anthem or the flag, I guess, so again, he was technically asked about peacefully protesting, but that the, the, the conversation was never about that. But then, like I said, it just lacked... Uh, a lack of understanding and empathy of what the message was and what the message always was about and what it is still currently about, even after, like I said, four years to get a better understanding. He just chose to, because he has the privilege to do so, stay inside his little bubble and and just, like I said, ignore everything that's going on across around the around the country. And since it doesn't affect him, and that's how a lot of people are, when things don't affect you, you can turn a blind, blind eye to it but like I said, it's, it's hard to see that now, especially when, like I said, so many people are coming around on the issue of like, yeah, all right, this is really a problem in this country. And like I said, it was a problem before this, before this incident with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, um, at least most recently. Ahmaud Arbery is a completely separate scenario, but that was also very sad. Um, like I said, those two were the most 
recent, I guess you could argue, the most recent incidences, I should say, of um, of police brutality that like garnered like a big national like news or notoriety. I said that just somehow he was able to evade all that info and talk and just focus it, like I said, on himself and what the flag means to him. And that's what I said. This was never what it was about. So like I said, he got attacked, rightfully so. Had to come out Thursday, issue an apology, which the Saints players defended him on. And I get because they are his teammates and they know him better than I do, a random person on Twitter. Or a random sports fan does. Like, they know his character. Obviously, like, people talk about, like, he's done a lot for the community in New Orleans. So, it's not necessary to say he's a bad person. But it was just, like, he was just tone deaf in this one scenario. So, they, they were more quickly, more quick to accept his apology. Maybe he had different conversations behind closed door than the statement he put out. But the statement he put out did not do it for me. Did not do it for a lot of other people. Because it wasn't, it still didn't really get down to the crux of why people were mad at him. Like, he touched on systematic racing, touched on oppression, touched on standing with his brothers, all that stuff. But again, the issue was that you took what Colin, what Colin's message was and completely disregarded that. And then, like I said, made it about yourself. Now, if he would have apologized for that specifically, like, I'm sorry that I took this message and and twisted it and turned it. Then I think the apology would have would have run more true for people, but because it didn't have any mention about that, had little mention about police brutality specifically, it just like I said, run hollow for a lot of people. So it was it was just it was bad all around. I mean, again, he's gonna have to make it right with the locker room boys. He's gonna have to make it right with the fans, even though um, I believe I mentioned this on on the last podcast. But if I didn't, people were chanting. Well, I think actually no, I don't think I would have mentioned this because it, this happened Wednesday, if I remember correctly. Um, but yeah, people are out there chanting F Drew Brees in the streets of New Orleans, which is, again, crazy to to have thought about even last week that people would be saying that about him. But it's how people feel, and it's understandable because it just seems like, again, when you're asking, when you're trying to get your attention, you're trying to get people to understand your message, they're just completely choosing to ignore it. Because, like I said, now, during this time where literally everyone and everybody is speaking out, it's hard for you to not know what what is going on and what this message is about. And then, like I said, it was never about the flag, never about the national anthem. No one is trying to disrespect that. Or at least Colin wasn't trying to disrespect that. And like I said, just to take it and twist it, you could understand why people are rightfully upset. Now, like I said, I don't think one statement, I don't even think we put out a follow-up video hours later. Like That's not going to be enough for a lot of people, and I believe that's completely fair. Like I said, he has to make it right with his teammates, but he has to make it right with me because I'm not going to be playing with him on Sundays. I'm not going to be the guy that has to have his back and fight for him and fight with him when it comes to, like, on that football field to try to win a championship. So, like I said, if I don't like his apology, that is what it is. It doesn't matter because he doesn't have to make it right with me. He has to make it right with those people in the locker room who oppose his opinion. And notably, if uh, unless I missed it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I didn't like one of the most aggressive people in terms of their response towards what he said on his team was Malcolm Jenkins, um, who was former former Saint, became Eagle, and now back to a Saint. We he he put, he had a long I think it was four minute message talking about like all of the issues he had with his statement, and he was notably not a person that if I like I said I, I didn't hear much from him. On social media today, I know you saw some things from Michael Thomas, saw some things from Alvin Kamara, from Kirkley. I think Demario Davis, linebacker, was on CNN. So they seem to forgive him pretty quickly, and that's that is what it is. That's their prerogative. But I know one of the people that was staunchly against what he said, and was one of, like I said, one of the most direct people in terms of his anger towards the comments, said nothing. So like I said, it's not going to be an easy path to forgiveness for everybody in that locker room. Some people will be quick. Some people will take a lot longer. Some people may never get over it. We, I mean, I don't want to say never, but um, some people, it may take a long, long time to get over it because, again, until he shows something different, like, just because, like, that's that's my, that's always been my issue with people who say something and apologize for the next day after they get the backlash is, like, are you apologizing because you learn from your mistake and realize what you said was wrong or are you apologizing because you got the backlash? 
Because like I said, his statement was consistent. He said the same thing Wednesday that he said years ago. So he had a lot of time in between then and now to learn, to understand, to talk to his teammates, talk to people in the community and understand like why this is such a big issue and why it should be such a big issue for them and for everybody, really. But he didn't. And like I said, I can't tell somebody how to spend their time, but he didn't take that time. So I can't expect him in 12 to 24 hours to then all of a sudden now understanding everything about the plight of the black man in this country. Like, that's just not, that's unrealistic. But like I said, um, until, like, until he makes those steps towards reforming his, his understanding, reforming his opinion on that topic, it would be hard for anybody to completely forgive him, I believe. Like I said, public or, or private. Because like I said, just, just putting out an apology is, okay, depending on what you say in your apology, but a lot of these apologies are just like, sorry that I, sorry that that I, what I said offended you, as opposed to me being sorry for saying what I said, if that makes sense. Like, you can apologize for you, basically what what it seems like a lot of, and not to say that Drew Brees was necessarily doing this, but what a lot of these apologies when you get from these social media people or influencers or athletes or companies whenever, when they have to issue public apologies that like, sorry that you took offense to what I said, as opposed to me being sorry for what it is that I said, and I'm going to now learn and change and adapt what I say going forward. And those are two completely different things, in my opinion. Until Drew Brees as a second, it's going to take a lot of people a long time to get over what he said. And we'll see if it ever does happen. It probably will at some point, but like I said, for the time being, it's just he's just in a rough spot, and it didn't have to be this way. You could have just, if this was his opinion, just say nothing. Because you should have known that now was not the time to say that. A couple years ago, you say it. Maybe even a month ago, you say that same thing. And people are still annoyed, but like, it's not going to be this. But like today, just the fact that he didn't realize that, him saying that now would cause such an uproar, is mind-boggling to me. I'm saying people over the weekend said much well, much less and still got attacked. So I don't understand. And not to say he's a guy that's actually on social media. He's like in his 40s, has kids. Like, I don't expect him to be on Twitter all the time. But like I said, just how no one on his team briefed him or prepped him before that interview to say, like, hey, look, if this comes up, say this or say that or don't say this. Just like, like I said, he could have said a lot of other things and not that, and he would not have gotten the backlash that he did, but he did. And now we are where we are. So, and like I said, that was, I imagine, the Drew Brees had a whirlwind last 24, 48 hours because um, when I say everybody was attacking him, I literally mean it seemed like everybody. Like, like this is no longer a, a like, oh, oh, okay, like I might feel this. Like, no, this is like either you're on the right side or wrong side of this. And Drew Brees was on the wrong side. He apologized, whatever. But we'll see if he can get back now on the right side as opposed to just apologizing for being on the wrong side. If he stays on the wrong side, then, like I said, he'll have bigger issues than my opinion of what his comments are. But that is that. So coming up um, after this next break, we're going to discuss how I believe the whole shut up and dribble or the whole stick to sports thing might be done forever. I'm going to explain why I feel like that after this break. So stay right there. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info.
Welcome back to the SMC Sports Podcast presented by the SMC Podcast. So, sticking to sports, I believe, from now until the end of time, will be a thing of the past. Um, and I think, and I believe this now, just because of the way we have seen, as we have already discussed, just about everyone be forced to say something about this topic, whether right, wrong, or in the middle. Everybody, every athlete, every entertainer, every in social media influencer, every league, every organization, every company, really, has said something about the issues that are plaguing this country. I mean, well, that have plagued this country, let me not say that are, that have plagued this country for hundreds of years, and like I said, are still plaguing this country to this day. Now, some organizations and leagues' comments were better than others, and some, like I said, athletes' comments were better than others. But, at this point, everyone has said something. So, like I said, from this point moving forward, I believe it will be nearly impossible to tell people to, quote-unquote, quote-unquote, excuse me, stick to sports, or, quote-unquote, shut up and dribble. And I think that's just because we've realized now the times that we're in. And before, and I, maybe it's because all these sports aren't going on. Um, maybe, like, I don't know, maybe that's the reason why everyone felt compelled, everyone felt like it was necessary for them to speak out or whatever. But, I mean, like, I guess because if you, if you think about it, if, if this were, because, I mean, some people seem to be, be forgetting, but there is still a pandemic going on outside. Stay safe, kids. Um, but if that weren't happening, it were a normal year, we would be what, mid-NBA Finals right now? We'd be mid-Stanley Cup Finals. Baseball would be in full swing. And the ways in which players might be speaking out would be a little bit different. Like, I imagine if, say, it was Lakers, whoever, Lakers, Bucks, just, just a chalk Finals. I imagine LeBron or or Anthony Davis or even, like, Giannis or other players on the Milwaukee Bucks or even other players on the Lakers would have felt compelled to say something before the game. Or maybe, I don't know if they have to is not the right word, but they might have been compelled to say something or do something before the game because it has happened in the past. Like people wore the I can't breathe shorts before the games for um, for the death and or murder of Eric Gardner in in New York City. Um, I guess, what was that, 2014? So they wore those shorts when he, I mean, he wore those shorts LeBron did and the Heat did and other, like, obviously, they weren't the only team, but you get the point that, like, they, people did that. So I'm curious to see what would have happened during that. But then again, since there was no sports, I wouldn't be like, oh, um, stick to sports. Oh, we don't want this in our sports, blah, 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 blah. And I'm saying, no one is saying that now. And maybe, and like I said, maybe it's because there's no sports. But no one is saying, like, hey, don't speak up. No one is saying, like, hey, you shouldn't be saying anything. No one is saying, hey, you don't have a voice. Like I said, whether you agree or disagree with their opinion on the topic, no one is saying that right now. And I just feel like it's because you really can't anymore. Like, the the issue that is plaguing this country has become such a problem, it honestly feels wrong to not say something or not do something or not to have an opinion on it. Like you, like, like, like I said, it's it's impossible to see what happened to George Floyd and not feel something. It's impossible to hear what happened to Breonna Taylor or see what happened to Ahmaud Arbery and not feel something or not want to say something. Like I said, it will at least maybe I don't speak for everyone, but from my perspective, it's hard to for that to happen. Whether you were, whether you were, whether sports were going on or not, like it's hard to be like. How do you not say something? And like I said, maybe it's just me, but like I don't see how people, especially the people who this could be affecting, which are African Americans, and that those make up a lot of the major. Well, the the they make up the two most popular major sports in this country. I don't say a lot of the major sports, but the two most popular major sports in this country, which are the NFL and the NBA. Like they, you you can't expect them not to say anything. And like I said, during a time where it seems like everyone is saying something, how do you tell them now in a couple months if this happens again in July or August or October or November? 
how do you tell them, like, no, stick to sports, no, don't say anything? I mean, even the NFL today, I don't know if it was officially put out by the NFL's Twitter account, but I know the, the NFL players, oh, well, I know the, the Packers put out their own separate video talking about these issues, but the NFL, a couple, I believe it was somewhere between, like, 10 to 15 NFL players put out a video talking and addressing these issues and like one of those like the way they have them say the same thing or have them complete each other's sentences while they interject different faces and voices into the video stuff like that um like I know Michael Thomas is the first guy so you look on his Twitter account you look on Saquon's Twitter account I'm gonna couple you look you look you look hard enough you, you'll be able to find the video but my point is they're putting that video out and the NFL is okay with them putting that video out so how do you then go back and say in a couple months, hey, I know this happened. I know you don't want to speak out, but ah, now's not the time. Like, how, like, I just don't understand how you can say that now when we've seen so many people willing to speak out. Like I said, so many people come around on the issue. Like, it's not like it's just now. African Americans speaking out about this issue. Not that it was before. I don't want to say that, but like before, it was like, oh, this is just a black issue. It's just a black issue. I mean, now, like I said, as you've been seeing the protests go on, you see the way some, not all, but some law enforcement officers have acted towards protesters. Like I said, not just black, not just white, not just male, not just female. The way you've seen them interact with these people, and in some cases, beat, beat these people and throw them around and do things that you, you don't understand. I mean, just tonight, there was, a, I believe it was in Buffalo, they pushed like a 75-year-old man to the ground, he started bleeding, and apparently in the original police report, they said that he tripped and fell. As opposed to, there was a reporter's video that clearly showed him being pushed to the ground. For, like I said, he did was he maybe where he shouldn't have been? It's possible. I don't know what the what the curfew laws or the rules are in Buffalo. But he was just coming up. He wasn't being aggressive because, again, he's an, he's an old man. He wasn't being aggressive. He wasn't being forceful. He just came up to towards a police officer. That was it. He just was walking towards a police officer. And you see the guy push him back, and then obviously he's an old man, so he's going to fall. But, like I said, when you see stuff like that, and then like the guys have already been suspended without pay, and the police department has put out a statement and everything, Like people are realizing that like, this is not just a black issue. Like, obviously, um, the percentage or the likelihood of it being an African-American is much higher. Though, I guess, if again, if people like to say, like, if you go by total numbers, like, white people are, are killed the most by cops, but again, they make up the majority of the country. So, that math, just simple math, makes sense. People don't don't try to be dense about this. Um, but, but, yeah, so just because, like, like, I, like I'm saying, people have, are realizing more and more, so I guess maybe, I don't know why it took George Floyd, and I tried to have a conversation with people about that, or why this one specifically spoke to them, and everybody's had different opinions on it, but like I said, for whatever reason, this is the one that struck them. So, everybody is saying this is wrong, and this is a problem. Everybody. Or, like, different walks of life, different professions, doesn't matter. Everyone is saying this. So then, if, and honestly, when, it happens again, how do you not allow your players to speak up? Like I said, it doesn't matter the league. How do you not allow them to speak up? How do you not allow them to protest in the manner in which they want? Because now that's what they're doing. And like I said, I don't think... I, I Obviously, it's partly because there's no sports. But again, even if there were sports going on, I know athletes, especially athletes in the or players in the NBA, would be doing something. I imagine NFL players would have still wanted to go to protests and things like that. They still, I mean, they've taken days off from virtual meetings and stuff, I would imagine, if they wanted to take a day off from OTAs or mini camps or whatever, they would have allowed it, because obviously there's more to life than just sports. And that's also the other aspect of it, is that with so much going on now, people are kind of like, uh, there are bigger things to focus on than sports. So I know before it was like, oh, sick to sports, I don't want politics in my sports, I don't want any issues in my sports, I use that as an escape. With sports gone for so long during this year, you've realized that there is more to life than sports. Obviously, sports, a world with sports is better than a world without sports, but the people are realizing that you can exist without sports, and there are things bigger and more prominent, and there are things, like I said, things that are happening in the world that are more prominent than 
what is going on in particular sports league at the time. So, in my opinion, it's going to be, to be impossible to ever be like stick to sports from here on out because they the the issues that are plaguing this country are bigger than that. They're more important than that. And and as you've been seeing, people begin and continue to come around on the issue. You realize just how hard it is it is going to be to try to silence or oh yeah, I guess silence is a good word, the silence the players' opinions on these different topics. It's going and like I I believe it is going to be impossible. Like how do you do that? How do you tell LeBron he can't speak out? How do you tell um uh, Deshaun Watson he can't he can't go to protest? How do you tell Trey Young he can't go to protest? How do you tell um even like I said, how do you tell Drew Brees he can't speak out on the way people protest? Like I said, you can't you just everyone has an opinion now. It just it's impossible to not feel something or say something about what you're seeing because it's a problem and obviously most people that live in this country want the best for this country and you want things to change you want everybody to held to be held to up to the expectation the standard that the constitution talks about is all men are created equal and all this other stuff that obviously has not been true for a lot of people in this country that aren't basically like white males like a lot of people don't have the, these equal rights that they claim that they were going to have when the country was founded, and people in in think that there should be a world where that is the case, and they're working to try to make a world where that is the case. And like I said, they're going to have opinions on it, so it's going to be impossible. And also, last thing about the shut up and dribble thing, I just thought it was kind of funny because the woman that said that, Laura Ingram, uh, I guess the anchor analyst, some on air talent, whatever you want to call her, for Fox News excuse me, who obviously was made, I don't say was made famous, but became more well-known to the non-Fox News-watching um, people of the world for saying that about LeBron. I forget exactly. I wish I remembered what the specific... I imagine it was something around this issue, or around, maybe it was around Cop, uh, Colin Kaepernick or something. But I, I can't remember exactly what LeBron's comments were that caused her to say that, but then I just thought it was funny when she said... He was talking about Drew Brees. He was just like, oh, everyone's allowed to have an opinion. That's the, again, not to get too, too political, but I thought, I thought that was funny to me because I'm just like, now it's not telling you Brees to shut up and throw a football because you agree with his opinion. But when you disagree now, it's like, hey, I don't want to, I don't want to listen to you or I don't want to hear you because this opinion, this topic doesn't affect me or your opinion doesn't affect me. Or I just don't want to talk about what you want to talk about. So I thought, and I think that's a lot of where the stick to sports thing kind of came from is that like, oh, well, I don't want to see or have to discuss the issues in which you're discussing because it doesn't affect me but like now I'm saying more people have come around to realize that like that issue that Colin Cockney was talking about is a serious issue f- f- in this country so there's just like how do you not talk about it because it's here it's not going away unless we do something about it so how do you you can't just avoid talking about it anymore I mean you can try but I just feel like people have come around more on being willing to discuss and I don't say debate per se, but just discuss or have discussions or have conversations, tough conversations around this topic and around what is happening in this country. And I believe that is a good start and I believe that is a step forward, but it's not going to stop there. And again, this isn't going to be the last time that it happens. Uh, or at least if, if, I mean, if this is the last one, I'll be utterly shocked. But since I don't, I don't think that's going to happen, um, we're going to be back here again at some point, probably this year, honestly. And like I said, when it happens, it's going to be hard to try to um, subdue or try to silence the opinions of these athletes. So, like I said, I just think this whole shut up and dribble thing or this whole stick to sports thing, it's going to be a thing of the past. It's just going to be too hard to try to, um, to to not be forced to say something the next time this happens. It's going to be too hard because you said it before. So how do you be like, oh, I only said it because I wasn't the the sport wasn't in session. Like that doesn't make any sense. You can't just have opinions when. You're at home. You have to pay for your opinions about everything. And it'd be unrealistic to be like, oh, yeah, I only cared because I was sitting at home not doing anything. Like, come on. That sounds that sounds foolish. But, yeah, I just don't think it is going to be possible to ever have athletes just, quote-unquote, stick to sports going forward. Speaking of going forward, the NBA is now set back in motion. 
they 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 vote on the plan, they approve the plan for their return to play um, in July, late July, I believe. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about what they voted on, what's going to happen uh, next, how it's all going to happen, and my opinions on everything that I, that they agreed to or didn't agree to. We're after the break, so stay right there. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. SMCpodcast.com for more info. SMC Podcast Network. So, if you didn't know or weren't paying attention, the NBA's Board of Governors voted Thursday to approve a 22-team format to restart the 2019-2020 season. July 31st in Orlando, Florida, the vote went 29-1 to in favor of it, with only the Portland Trail Blazers voting against the proposal. Um, the two sides have obviously worked very well back and forth as compared to the MLB. So they were able to come to not 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 the same with the MLB, but I know they their discussions been a little more tent, uh, contentious, I should say. Um, so luckily the NBA and I was able to get something going. Though I mean, I did kind of find the timing of it funny, just because in the middle of all these players speaking up and doing things, it's just like, oh yeah, we figured it out now. Like we got a plan, guys. Again, they they've been working it through for this or through this for months. I saw the timing of it. Not to be a conspiracy conspiracy theorist type of guy, it would just Time was kind of funny. Um, but yeah, like I said, it still happened. And um, so, yeah, so as under the plan, 13 Western Conference teams and 9 Eastern Conference teams will play 8 regular season games, or 8 regular season quote unquote seeding games, is what they call it. A possible playing tournament for the 8th seed and playoffs at the Walt Disney World Resort in Orlando. Obviously, the top 16 teams in the Eastern and Western Conferences will be joined by teams currently within 6 games of the eighth place spot in the two in the respective conferences so that is New Orleans, Portland, San Antonio, Sacramento, and Phoenix in the West, and then Washington in the East. The playing tournament will include the number eight and number nine teams in a conference if the ninth seed finishes the regular season within four games of the eighth seed. In that case, the number nine seed would be would need to beat the number eight seed twice in a row to earn a playoff berth while the 8th seed would need to win only one of the two potential games. The NBA said the season resumption is contingent on an agreement with the Walt Disney Company, which owns ESPN, to use the Walt Disney World Resort for all games, practices, and housing. Apparently, the teams will begin training in Orlando starting July 9th through the 11th, and the league also offered dates beyond the July 31st to October 12th, Season window with the draft lottery set on August for uh, the draft lottery set for August twenty fifth, and the NBA draft um, is supposed to happen on October fifteenth, and the twenty twenty and twenty twenty one season likely to begin December first. It's a little tight, but hey, to his own. Just just told ESPN that free agency could begin October eighteenth with training camp starting November tenth. Though teams were told to consider the free agency date as flexible, which makes sense because I mean we're talking about. The season's going to end October 12th, and then people are going to start back up for training camp in in less than a month. Seems a little shaky to me, but hey, it's each his own. Um, oh, that's interesting. Some members of the Board of Governors whose teams were left out of the Orlando restart disagreed with the 22-team format, but cast but decided to cast yes votes anyway. 
which I mean, I kind of get because you still want that extra money, but at the same time, it's like, what's like, why are you coming back to potentially risk getting the Rona? That doesn't, that doesn't seem that serious to me. Now again, it's not my money that I would be or would not be making, but in my opinion, playing eight, ten, how many of our games just because seems kind of pointless. Um. So the way that the schedule more or less would be set up is the regular season will extend 16 days with five to six games per day. There'll be four hours between games on each individual court to accommodate overtimes, cleanings, and warm-ups. The league will be using three courts on a complex for games. In the eight-game regular season format, each team is expected to play one back-to-back. The NBA is expected to be aggressive in moving up dates to start playoff series when the previous round's series come to an end, and the NBA Finals format is expected to include games every other day, which I believe normally it's like every two days, maybe even three days, depending on travel, but now ain't nobody got time for that. So, they, they kind of just got to give, I guess, like you said, you can't play back-to-backs in the Finals, that's foolish, but like you kind of have to keep it moving, or you're going to talk about the season going into like late October, and now you're really pushing up against football season, which no one wants, which, I mean, hey, who knows if that even happen? Who knows if this will even happen? But it is what it is. Uh, as I mentioned, the Blazers were the lone team to vote no, obviously, and they were eager to resume the season, but voted no based on a belief of the organization and players' input that they were that there were more competitive and innovative formats on the table, including those that addressed 2020 lottery odds um, based on the regular season results in Orlando. So, like I said, to each their own. But that was the Blazers' decision to to vote no when no one else was really going to do that. Uh, the NBA froze lottery odds positions based on records when the season was suspended on March 11th. Um, and the 14 teams in the August 25th lottery will include the eight teams left out of the regular season resumption in Orlando and the six teams that participate in the restart but don't qualify for the playoffs. The Blazers were hopeful that the full regular season body of work would be reflected in percentages used in the league's draft percentage odds, which, I mean, I guess it doesn't say that they it isn't, it is or isn't going to come down like that, but I don't know. This one to be difficult, it seems like. Um, the NBA also is planning uniform daily testing for the coronavirus within the Disney campus environment. Um... And also, life in the bubble will be governed by a safety, or a set of safety protocols, excuse me. While players and coaches will be allowed to golf or eat at outdoor restaurants, they will also need to maintain social distancing. Social told ESPN's Ramona Shelbourne. Don't know how hard this can be enforced, but this is in there, so there's that. If a player were to test positive, the league's intent would be to remove that player and quarantine them, and they receive treatment, and but then just continue on with while testing other uh, team members. Like I guess, like you said, as they continue on, just continue to test them as much as you can. And employees at the Disney Resort will have to maintain similar protocols. For example, no staff will be allowed into players' rooms, and hallways will be carefully managed to avoid crowding. So, I guess they... No, that's interesting, because then I guess they can't really... So then what What can they do? Whatever. Thomas, like, if they can't allow into rooms, then you can't make beds, can't change seats or whatever, so don't. Because it just give them the sheets to then change, but no one's ever done that in a hotel. Whatever. Um, so, yeah. Um, overall, I mean, I figured the 22 team format was probably going to be the best case scenario. Um, like, to the Blazers' slight credit, they probably could have been a little bit more innovative because I feel like eight games isn't really enough for anybody to really mount a, a true comeback, if you will. Um, just because, again, you're gonna you're, every team's gonna be rusty, and from like say the Blazers' perspective, there I think about three three and a half games back somewhere around there, and for them, basically every game's gonna be a playoff game. I mean, same thing for the Grizz. I mean, same thing for all those lower seeded teams. Every game is basically gonna be a playoff game where you can't really afford to lose or or shake that rust off, if you will, because you have to keep up. But at the same time, it's like it's going to be impossible if you haven't played basketball in a team environment in what will be over four months by the time the league starts back up. You will have when I played a full real game against another team for over four months by the time the league starts back up. So it's like it's impossible to not be rusty. 
But when you look at teams like the Lakers or the, which I mean, I guess that's in fairness that you should have just been better before they were on a hit. You wouldn't be having these issues. But like I said, when you look at teams like the Lakers, Bucks, Raptors, Clippers, Nuggets, the teams at the top, they can just work themselves back into game shape because there's no there's no pressure for them because they're still going to be in the playoffs regardless. But when you're talking about those five teams in the West outside of the eight seed kind of fighting for position, it's going to be hard for them to be that same luxury. And also, there's not as many bad teams for you to play. Like everyone's like no one's facing those bottom eight seeds in those in their last in those in, I should say in that eight in that eight game window. You're all facing pretty much playoff teams. So, this you don't get the the luxury I should say of an easy win here and easy win there. You kind of have to face every team you're facing is hard, and you're going to have to try to work yourself back into um, back into playing form. But you kind of don't have the luxury to do that, like I said, because you have to win every game. So, it's a tough scenario for those teams, but again, you could argue, hey, if you were better during the regular season, you wouldn't have to worry about that, and that is a fairly fair point. Um, I would argue that a best of three, I haven't said you don't want to drag on this playing tournament too long, but, I mean, just to say that, like, oh, for the nine seed, it's basically just like a one-game playoff. Like, why did I come back for a one-game playoff? And if I'm the eight seed, if I'm up four games, why am I playing two games to determine if I can make the playoffs or not. A team might just might be a bad matchup for you, but if you're if you're four games up, like you're not catching them. So I was like that aspect of it is a little weird. I feel like it should be like a best of three series, something like that, as opposed to just like I said, one potentially two games. That doesn't seem I mean none of this is fair. But that doesn't seem fair. Just like you just make it a, a short a shortened series. Like the whole best of, or like I said, potentially one and done, or best of two. Like, so if I split with you, then I'm, I don't get in? Like, like that's just, it seems weird. I mean, just make it best of three. That's what they should have done. But, again, too late now. This is what the plan that they have. So, this is what they're going to go with, but I know I would have tried to tweak that a little bit or make it a little bit more, like the boys are trying to say, innovative. Because, again, now you're just, if you're not in that nine spot, which, again, you had a lot of time to get there. Then it's just like you came back for eight games. And also on top of that, like they're talking about how some coaches may not be on the sidelines because I guess those three coaches, I believe there's only three coaches. So Alvin Gentry, Mike D'Antoni, and and Pop, Ray Popovich, those are the three coaches that are 65 and above, and that's obviously in that ass, at-risk um, group. So they may not be on the sidelines, which I would completely understand because why – risk a coach's health, the last thing you want to do is have something severely happen to a coach because you try to bring the season back. Now you got to deal with that lawsuit, and then, I mean, you basically got to shut the season down. No one's going to... If they see something happen to a legitimate coach, then they're not... Who's going to play? I mean, I don't want to say who's going to play because some people will play, but I'm saying, in theory, that would be kind of crazy when you think about it. So, don't want to do that. But... So, yeah, you got to kind of figure out what... And there's no... I was thought I had a butt. There is no butt. You don't have to deal with that, in my opinion. So you got to worry about that. And also, like I said, if the if a player gets it, because we'll talk about in in a, in a segment or two, uh, the issues with um, trying to get these leagues started back up and, and some of the issues that college football teams have been dealing with when trying to get their summer practices going in terms of clusters of, of viruses. Um, but yeah, just like if you test somebody, that, and if somebody tests positive, I should say, there's no way to tell if their if their teammate has it for probably a couple of days, depending on when they got it. So it's like they could have it for a couple of days and not show up yet. And now they're going all about they're playing games, doing things. And now you have a whole could potentially have a whole epidemic throughout the league. And that's again what I imagine they're trying to avoid. But if a player tests positive and you just like, all right, we'll take him out, we'll keep going, like that doesn't seem like the safest thing to do, in my opinion. So you gotta kind of watch what you're gonna do there. Like I said, it all sounds all good. Like, oh yeah, when this happens, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. Until it actually happens, and you're like, oh, this wasn't a good plan at all. So we'll see what happens there. But I'm just saying, it seems a little risky to just be like, hey, yeah, we'll take him out, we'll quarantine him, give him treatment, but we'll keep pushing. It's not gonna, I prom- it's not gonna promise you. It's not gonna be an issue. It's not gonna be an issue at all. Because, 
I mean, they shut down the league in the beginning for a reason, because it was going to be an issue. And the diseases is no different now, and we know just about as much as we did now, as we do now as we did then. So, like I said, I don't know why it'd be an issue back then, but now we're just going to power through it. I, I mean, I get why, because the money, and they want to get through the season. But that shouldn't come at the... Uh, that shouldn't come in spite of player and coach and people's safety. Like, that shouldn't be what's more important. It's just finishing out the season should not be more important than people's health. But... Again, I'm not in charge. I'm the one that had to make that tough decision, so I can't really judge Adam Silver's back was really against the wall. If, if people really want to get this restarted, there's not really much they could do other than, other than like I said, just say, we're going to quarantine this guy if he does catch it. Because, I mean, while it does make sense to me, there's really no other way to, to finish out the season unless that's what, you're gonna, that's what the plan is. So we'll see how that plan works. And speaking of plans... There have been different plans, discussions, debates on how to provide teams with home court advantage. And all of them kind of stink. But we're going to talk about them. So, we'll discuss all those different potential options and ways in which you can give teams, quote-unquote, home court advantage. We're after this break. So, stay right there. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Obviously, this is not a part of the plans. I don't... We don't know for certain if these are or aren't going to be a part of the plans, but this was a topic that was discussed, I believe, on... What was this, Wednesday? Yeah, it was, it was discussed on Wednesday, and uh, things through ESPN and some other different platforms and media outlets, and I thought it was kind of interesting. Like, again, I will say, a lot of these ideas are bad, but, I mean, sometimes you got to work through bad ideas to get through good... To get two good ideas, I just say, so... Um, there's that. But overall, how I see teams are trying to angle for alternatives to give them, quote-unquote, hard home court advantage, like I said. Um, so, with like with like the playoff games and obviously all happening in one arena in the same spot where everyone, they were with no fans, too, on top of that. So, no one, there's no real difference between home and away teams or, or higher seed or lower seed other than, I guess, the colors you're Wearing though, obviously, again, throughout the playoffs, one team is worse. But there'll be no way to differentiate the the home and the way because everyone's playing the same spots. So, with uh, this is from CBS Sports, with sixteen playoff teams after they whittle it down in the same location, traditional home court advantage flies out the window. That essentially places all sixteen of those teams on a level playing field, despite their record and outcome. The NBA's best teams, i.e., Lakers, Bucks, Clippers. Raptors, those kind of teams um, of, uh, that the NBA's best teams are hoping to avoid. Internally, the highest seed, seeds are discussing ways in which the benefits of home court advantage might be recreated according to ESPN's Dave McMenamin. Among those ideas that have been discussed are the following. One, higher seeds getting the ball at the beginning of the second, third, and fourth quarter. Is that every game? If that's every game. Oh, I mean, Again, I said most of these ideas are bad. But if that's every game, that, that's wild. Um, two, the higher-seeded team being allowed to choose one player who would be allowed seven fouls instead of six, 
three higher seeds being granted an extra coaches challenge, four higher seeds getting preferential hotel selection at Disney, or five higher seeds being allowed to transport their actual hardwood courts to Disney to recreate the feel of home court advantage. Uh, so we'll get back to all those in a second, but additionally there have been discussions about a plan that has had fan support for years and obviously we'll discuss the potential if they're going to do the whole World Cup style uh, tournament of allowing higher seeds to pick their first round opponents. Aside from providing greater reward to the best teams for the excellent seasons, it will create an entertaining and likely lucrative debatable TV event. The last one, Benman reports that this plan would be considered unlikely as players around the league would be afraid of the intangible consequences of offending opposing teams. I mean, hey, look, if, you, if you're... This is no different than just picking people on the playground. Like, if you pick the wrong team, hey, look, you pick the wrong team, you'll get beat. It is what it is. Being afraid to give professional athletes extra motivation is kind of like a wild thing, especially when you do this for the All-Star game. Like, they already, it's not, like, if if before before they started doing that all-star game selection format, even though it's taped, but whatever, before they started doing that, if you were going to say that, like, oh, you don't want to offend people, okay, cool, whatever. But they, they literally picked their all-star teams playground style, and they, they have commentary back and forth. So, if you are, if that already exists, like, why are you continuing to be afraid of offending opposing teams? Like, it is what it is. Like, I don't think they, especially with no fans or anything, it's, like, it's not like there's going to be any way to add, add like, add pressure, add, like, fan enthusiasm or things like that to the to the games or intensity to the games. Like, they're, they're already going to be weird. Like, again, you really think saying, oh, I, instead of wanting to play the Pelicans or the Grizzlies, I want to play the Mavericks. Like, that's going to really make Luka play that much harder against the Lakers like no, I mean come on guys I don't, I think that's just them like, I don't understand like why they're so afraid of hurting people's feelings or whatever like these are all adults they're all grown men like just everybody has been in a situation where they've had to get picked for a team out of a lineup it's happened but it is what it is like I don't I don't see why being so why teams or players would be so offend uh, be so afraid I should say of offending teams and giving them extra motivation like it's happened Already and most of the times the better team wins, especially when it's a series. Like it's one game. If it was one game, all right, because you might could get that energy for the one game. But if it's a seven game series, like generally the longer the series are, the better chance the better team wins. Whoever that would be, because you have more chances to win. And obviously the home court advantage helps, but that's not that doesn't exist anymore. But I mean, come on, guys, that would actually be interesting if they decided to do that. But it doesn't seem like that's going to be um, possible. Now, in fact, any plan, well, this is back to the article, in fact, um, any plan in this vein will be fighting an uphill battle, and that is because there are only so many teams with high seeds, but passing any sort of plan will require both union support and two-thirds vote from the league's governors. Nobody is likely to be eager to vote for a plan meant to benefit teams like the Lakers at their own expense, even if it would be a just alternative to home court advantage. None of the proposals have formally been presented to the NBA's competition committee, and Bucks coach Mike Boonholzer, who has the NBA's best record and is on the committee, hasn't advocated for any sort of advantage. I've been just hoping that we actually play games, which it sounds like they're at least going to try to. Um, I don't care if if they even give us home court advantage. Boonholzer told ESPN's Golik and Wingo on Wednesday, "I'm like just 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 be sure we play. We've got to get to Orlando. We've got to have a chance to play for a championship in the playoffs. That's all he really wants." And lastly, teams with higher seeds have the ultimate advantage going into any series, the better record. In most cases, having a better record means being a better team. A home court advantage exacerbates that in normal years, the NBA's best team should still be expected to succeed in the playoffs even without it, which is kind of where, I went, where I'm at. Like, hey, look, if you're a better team, you're a better team. No, we need these advantages, quote-unquote. So let's go run through them again one more time. So the first one was higher seeds getting the ball at the beginning of the second, third, and fourth quarter. This is terrible because... If if it most with most of these, I believe this is an every game thing, and I'm like, how is that reasonable? Like you have the better record than me, so that means I never get to start a quarter with the ball in the entire series. Like that, no shot. That that that's foolish, wholeheartedly. Because again, the point of home court advantage means that it you just have more home games. That's really all it is. 
you just have more home games. If, they, if it's a four game series and I get swept, we both play two home games. Obviously, the longer the series goes, the more home games, the higher seed gets. But that's all home court advantage is supposed to be. Just at an advantage. This is not an advantage. This is just limiting the the opposing team, like limiting the amount of possessions they have and things like that. If you're giving one team, oh, outside the jump ball, potentially three extra possessions. When normally they would only get, when both teams usually get the team that wins the jump ball gets it in the fourth, and then the team that loses gets it in the second and the third. Like, what? Whoa. No. There's no way anyone would vote for that. So that's number, that one's out. High is being allowed to choose one player with seven fouls instead of six. Nah, we're not bending the rules. I mean, well, I mean, these all bend the rules, but like, like actual, like, rules, like, like the possession thing, that's like, whatever. But saying like LeBron can now get seven fouls. You know he doesn't normally foul up, but now he can get seven, or Giannis can get seven fouls, or James Harden, or any of those guys. Like, ooh, no, no shot. Because again, it's not like these things would have to be like you flip it. So the first two games, like the um, LeBron would get seven fouls, or Anthony Davis, or whoever. Then the second two games, John Moran or Zion or somebody would get second seven two uh, seven fouls. That's that's what the point of home court advantage is it's supposed to be. A back and forth thing, not just like throughout the entire thing, one team gets a higher thing. I think that's the problem with a lot of these rules, if I'm understanding them correctly. Maybe I'm wrong, and that's it's not just a one game thing, but it seems like it's the, or an every game thing, I should say, but it seems like it's an every game thing. And I'm saying because of that, that's where I'm like, whoa, this is an issue. Because how do you let the, for an entirety of a series, LeBron gets, could, could potentially get seven fouls if it goes seven? How does that make any sense? So yeah, that's not gonna happen. National coaches challenge is like not a big enough deal to where like that might could slide. But again, it should it should fluctuate. So first two games, the higher seed gets it, and the second two games, the lower seed gets it, stuff like that. And the coach challenge is not. It's I mean they're they're used, but they're not like used like that much to where I could give the team a big big advantage if they have one extra one. But again, that is an advantage, and that's what the point of it is. The preferential hotel selection is interesting because I don't really know how much better or worse these hotels are going to be under these circumstances. Like, maybe under normal circumstances, would they be better or worse hotels? Yes, of course. But right now, when you're just, like, you're just you're just there just to be there, you're not really worried about it location-wise or distance from the arena, stuff like that. I don't really know if that'll be a big difference, technically, but again, that's a small thing to where that's like, all right, that's fine. Just every series, just the high seed. But again, it's just like I would think you wouldn't want teams moving hotels more than they have to. So you're saying that potentially, like the four or five, the four seed gets to pick their hotel in the first round, and then the second round, the you could potentially be moved out of that hotel. Like that seems kind of unnecessary. So that's my biggest issue with that one. And then the last one, the hardwood court thing. Again, I mean, I guess that makes it a little bit more normal, but. In my opinion, what gives teams home court advantage is the location and the fans. And neither of those things are going to matter in these games. So it's like, it's hard to even recreate that. So that's why I'm saying all these plans are kind of foolish other than... I wouldn't be opposed to... And I think the the uh, NHL is doing this, though. This doesn't really work with the... NBA. I, think, I believe they're reseeding every round and not just like after the first bit. Like I think they're reseeding every round teams, which I think that's a cool idea in an innovative way, and that that would be fun. Although it has nothing to do with home court advantage. I think that would just be a fun thing to do for the playoffs. Um, but I said home court advantage-wise, I think letting the teams pick their opponent is in the first round. That's that's one benefit for having a higher seed, because you want to you want to give people a reward for being the better team throughout the year. And right now, they don't have a reward, so that's kind of unfair for them, to a degree. So I'm saying that that works, and or again, some of these ideas wouldn't be that bad if you just have it for both sides. Like I said, you can't just have it for so high seed team every game gets that. Like that's different than you first first two games, like I said, than the second two games. If you're doing that, then something, then the possession thing or the seven fouls thing, or even the coach's challenge thing, that could not that it would get passed, but that's at least a better idea. If you're just having it for the entirety of a series, the higher seed gets that one advantage. Like, that seems like way too much. Especially for us, the entire playoff. So if you're the one seed, you make it 
to the conference finals, you're just going to have a you're going to have potentially up to 21 games with your best player getting seven fouls when the other team's not going to have like that. Just seems that's a little bit too much of an advantage. Like we can't we can't overcompensate because they don't have any advantage. Like that's that doesn't make it right. Like you got to try to find a nice balance, and I don't think that is the is the real kind of balance in my opinion. So. I imagine they're going to have to come up with something because just doing nothing is not going to work. But some of the things they suggested outside of, again, the picking the teams thing, or picking their first, at least teams in the first round specifically, not not going to work. It doesn't make any sense. Sounds foolish. Just trying to make, just trying to do too much. We don't have to, I say we want to help them a little bit, but we won't have to do a bunch of extra stuff. Just keep it simple, keep it plain. That's why the coach challenge thing probably is the most likely one to get past. It's, it's not that big and it's not going to add to the... I mean, it's going to add to the game if you have an extra challenge, but it's not going to be a really, really big difference to what it is normally. A player getting an extra amount of fouls or a player or a team getting the possession every quarter, potentially, that's a big difference. Then again, just a team being able to challenge one more time. So I think that would be the most likely one to get past, but again, I'm just getting past all these ideas. are Not, not great, in my opinion. You may disagree. Um, you are more than welcome to. Um, but yeah, so coming up after this next break, we're going to discuss, as I said, we would, I believe in the last segment, Alabama. Them, along with some other teams, are starting to get their summer camps working with all their college athletes, and they're having some issues when it comes to controlling that Rona. So we discussed that and kind of how it outlines how other college teams or how leagues will have to deal with the disease when they try to come back and try to start up, if you will, if you're talking about MLB or the NFL. So, like I said, we'll discuss that right after the break. Stay right there. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? The GSMC College Football Podcast is your ticket to all things college football. Join us as we talk college football from the national championship, the college rivalries, the bowl game, to the Heisman Trophy, to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, the Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Download the GSMC College Football Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. As I said, Alabama football having some issues with that coronavirus. This is from CBS Sports, though. Again, you can find it through various outlets. Whichever outlet you, you chose to look at, that's on you. But, like I said, I'm on CBS Sports. Um, headline, Alabama football. At least five players have reportedly tested positive for the coronavirus. Big yikes. Alabama players have begun to return to campus ahead of voluntary workouts starting next week. At least five of the players have already tested positive for the for the coronavirus, according to 247 Sports. The names of the players who tested positive for COVID-19 have not been disclosed. I mean, they really don't need to be. Uh, Simone Eli of CBS 42 in Birmingham reported that not only did five unidentified players test positive, but that many more could have been subject to quarantine as roughly 50 players were gathered together on the band field on Wednesday. So there is that. Um, Alabama and the rest of the SEC is able to open up for voluntary off-season workouts on June 8th. Eli reports that the group of players on the football field were there on their own. Luckily, I guess you could. I mean, not luckily because some of them now have their own. But luckily they didn't infect like other just regular people, non-football players. And so they were on the field on their own and not part of any organized team activity. 
Dixie announced last month that it will allow teams to begin voluntary off-season workouts on June 8th. The conference's announcement detailed the proper procedures that need to be taken by schools with the player who tests positive. Student athletes must be screened before arriving on campus within 72 hours of entering facilities and on a daily basis upon resumption of athletic activities. Players who test positive must be immediately isolated, and the school will begin to contact will begin contact tracing and following CDC and local health guidelines. Alabama is not the first school, though, to have players test positive for COVID-19. Multiple Oklahoma State players tested positive la- this week. I, I was going to say last week, but this week. And Iowa State announced its first positive test within the athletic department on Wednesday. The majority of schools either have already be- started. I don't know what I was going to say. They began to start at literally the same thing. I don't know why I had to correct myself, but this is what it is. The majority of schools, I should say, the majority of schools have either already started their off-season activities or off-season training, if you will, or will begin to do so in the next 10 days due to the returning, due to the players returning to campus Due to the increased number of the increased amount of testing, because of that, more news of positive tests will likely be coming throughout the college football world. So, that last sentence is very true and is very important, just because as you test more, you are going to be expected to find more positive tests. That's just a reasonable thing, unless, of course, you believe like the president believes where he said that if we didn't test as much there wouldn't be as many positive tests which i mean i guess again he's he's correct but you can't afford to do that in a situation like this because you need to make sure everybody's healthy so you don't infect other players who then could infect coaches and trainers and things like that you could give to their families it'd be potentially whole mess and they'd have a big lawsuit on their hands so you don't want that um but yeah so just between alabama and like like they said oklahoma state and Iowa, I think it was Iowa State. Yes, it was Iowa State. So you're already seeing people, before the workouts even start, you're finding people who test positive. Like when they're showing up to the, the their respective campuses just to start up the workouts, you're already seeing people test positive. And that's why I'm saying it's going to be tough. And that's why I've been saying, I've been consistent on this. It's going to be tough for any sports league to finish. Because to not expect somebody to test positive at some point throughout the season is unrealistic. And especially when you're talking about college fo- I mean, it's going to be mildly easier for professional sports. So you can There's only a finite amount of people. And obviously for NFL teams, that number is a little bit bigger. But there's a finite amount of people. You don't, you don't have to worry about but so many people. But when we're talking about college athletics, especially in states and in places where a lot of campuses will be open this this coming fall, which, again, is another thing I may not agree with, but having a sister that is college age, she claims that virtual learning is not it. So, again, if, if you have a situation where maybe you could prepare your teachers to be better at virtual teaching for this next semester, but that's not what they were designed to do, that's not what they expected to do, that's, I don't want to say design, but that's not what they were expected to do, that's not what they're paid to do, is teach virtually. And that's a, that's a completely different aspect when it comes to doing that as opposed to teaching in person. So if that learning experience is not going to be good, obviously people aren't going to want to have to do that, so they're going to want to have to go back to the status quo or the norm when it comes to, when it comes to teaching, or learning, I guess you could say. And like I said, that's going to be the case, and campuses are going to be open, it's the numbers are going to go up even more because all right you have five people on one team that's cool that's great that's fun and everything but now imagine if those five people would have been going to classes with 100 200 depending on the campus sometimes maybe even five six i think the biggest class while i was at penn state was in thomas that was up to like 700 kids Again, you're not sitting next to all the kids, but again, when you have a class has that big, you just a couple drop like a couple sprinkles of people having the COVID here and there. And now you're now you're talking about potentially fifty to hundred people just from that class getting, it, and then who knows who else they could give it to. So that's kind of where the problems would come in. Like I said, there's problems in all sports, so it's not. I want to just put hold 
college sports feet to the fire when it comes to this. But when we're talking about college sports, it is going to be, in my opinion, nearly impossible for you not to have at least a few players on your team test positive with so many with so many people. Because again, their rosters are even bigger than the NFL rosters. They had could have up to like eighty to ninety kids. Plus, like I said, coaches and um, other faculty, staff, uh, trainers, everything, all the works, all the normal things you would have, an equipment manager, stuff like that. So we're talking about 90 kids plus all that extra stuff. I mean, it sounds like a recipe for disaster. Now, I get it. I, as much as anybody, want to watch sports, especially football. It's my favorite sport. But I suppose it's like slightly behind, but football is just a quick like a, a tiny, tiny step above. But I'm saying with that, I very much want to watch football this fall. I don't know what I'm going to do without it. I mean, I've been more or less fine without basketball and baseball and hockey. I only watch the Stanley Cup playoffs. Um, but I've been mostly fine without that stuff. Like I said, you get to the fall and there's no football. Now we're talking about something completely different. Um, but even with that, like I said... It's going to be hard to try to contain this once you have all these kids on campus. You have thousands and thousands of kids on campus. Like, what do you do? How do you keep everybody safe? I understand you can put in procedures. There's another thing I was talking with my sister about. You can put in procedures. You can put in rules. You can put in regulations. But unless you have a way to officially enforce them, there you have a lot you're you're having these kids take on a lot of risk just for what well i guess well i mean in the, from the athlete standpoint for what to play a season that might not finish out anyway and like i said you could potentially get it or and i know generally speaking these few kids are going to be fine but again you've seen people you've seen good in shape college athletes collapse on the court or on the field just like just doing regular stuff, so who knows how they're who knows what some sort of underlying conditions they may have that they may find out that they had through testing positive for the Rona. Because the thing about underlying conditions, you don't always know that you have them because again they're underlying. I mean, some people do, and so it's not it's not a completely common thing. But not everybody knows about all the underlying conditions, especially. Normal people, though, I mean, they go to doctors maybe a little bit more than the average person does. But for the average person, they won't be getting a normal, like, little checkup here. And they're not getting everything tested. They're not getting everything checked out. So now you get the, you get, you test positive and all of a sudden your body's trying to fight it off. And you realize that you have a condition that you didn't know you had before. Now a person that's seemingly healthy is now, now struggling with the disease. And again... Overall, the numbers say that the the younger, the, the age group of people that would be taking part in college athletics would nor, like overwhelmingly be fine, but all it takes is one, and you don't want to be that one school. You've seen how situations when college athletes just, like I said, just one at Maryland recently, though it wasn't due to a disease, it was just, they were just overwork at, I forget exactly what the whole story was with the Maryland um, player that passed away a couple of years ago, but you saw how messy that situation got. Imagine this, where it's like that. All right, you're working the kid hard. You may not know you're working him that hard. I mean, you probably should lean off the kid because he's still a kid. But you may not know that it's going to lead to that. With this, you know that it could potentially lead to something bad. It could lead to death because over a hundred thousand people in this country have passed away due to the disease already. Maybe more, maybe less, depending on how after you believe those numbers are. But it's a lot of, it's a, I mean, it's not a lot relative to like the millions and millions of people in the country, but just like in terms of other countries and around the world, it's a lot of people. And I'm saying with that, you don't, you don't want anybody associated with sports to be in that group of people. Because that happens, then you're, or then it's, who know, like I'm saying, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what kind of lawsuits, what kind of anything's going to happen. Sports, again, may shut down immediately just because, again, it may be too dangerous. So I'm saying you don't want to be a part of that. You don't, well, don't want to be the reason for that. You don't want to be, the, like I said, the 
you don't want to be the reason why your school has a lawsuit. You don't want to be the reason why someone's life is, and so someone is without their life while why a family is without a loved one. You don't you don't want to be that reason for your school. You don't want to have to carry that burden. But like I said, with everybody trying to play sports, it's a possibility, and it's just it's a situation where. I don't know, it's just it's tricky because I, I understand why all these sports leagues and all these teams and all these different organizations and stuff want to get colleges, universities, want to get stuff back started. But he's not going to wear a mask on the field or on the court. It's just, uh, it's just not going to happen. So I'm saying with that, you run the risk of these people. There's not, there's not you're going to see these people wearing masks on the sideline. I, I mean, maybe they will, but I would be shocked if that happened. And I'm saying, then who knows what could happen? And that's what I'm saying. There's just so much uncertainty about this. I don't see... I just never really understood why. Anyone's missing, especially when you're talking about kids. Like, there's no... I mean, if these are supposed to be amateurs. You're supposed to be looking out for these kids and their futures. You forcing them to play through a pandemic does not sound like risking... Does not sound like a worthwhile risk for them. Especially when they're not getting paid. Now, if you're an athlete and you have an obligation to a contract and you want to get paid and things like that, ours is just a different scenario. But these college athletes aren't getting paid legal. I mean, through like legal means. They may be getting paid through their universities and stuff, but that's completely separate. But they're getting paid. Like they're not getting a paycheck. They're not. They're not on a contract. But still being treated like they are because they're being forced to play through a pandemic. Like it's just when you think about it, it's really nuts to me, at least. But not everybody's gonna feel the same way. I do not everybody's going to feel the same way about this pandemic. People still out there think it's a hoax. I mean, hey, to each his own. We're all tied to our opinions in this country. Some, in my opinion, are more correct than others. But they're all entitled to an opinion. And like I said, you may not agree with me on my opinion on the pandemic, but I'm just saying until we have a safe way to play sports, which we don't right now, it seems a little dangerous. Especially if you're going to do it for no pay. If you're going to do it at least... At least when professionals do it, they're like, all right, there's money on the line. I can understand why they're doing it. These kids don't have anything. Like, they're not getting a paycheck. They're not getting, they're not, they're not getting endorsement money, nothing. They're just out there risking, maybe even if it's not their life, they're risking a coach's life or their parent's life or grandparent's life or a sibling's life or a friend's life or another student's life. That's what they're risking for nothing but to line the pockets of their universities and their coaches. I mean, something about that just just rubs me the wrong way. But it is what what it is. So after this last break, we're going to come back here, and we're going to discuss or we do a little thing that I think we can continue to do. You know, I've I've done like different top fives and different topics that have been um, re- re- I don't want to say recurrent, but I've done more than once on different types of things. But I think this one specifically. We can do because it can apply to literally anything in any sport, in any team, in any player. And we do a nice little game of stock up and stock down. So we're going to talk about, let's just start first, we're going to talk about football teams heading into the uh, new season. Teams that I believe, whose stocks I think, or no, it's not stock up, stock down, or buy or sell. So teams whose stocks I would be buying, obviously because it means they're on the rise. Or teams stocks who I think that you should be selling, because obviously they're Maybe going to take a little bit of decline. I'm not going to be right about all these, but hey, give us something to talk about. So we'll discuss those right after the break. So stay right there. Check out the show built around the women of MMA from the UFC, Invicta FC, Bellator, and one championship. We got the fights covered. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts, past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast.
So as I said, not stock up, stock down. Buy or sell. So like I said, this is a segment that may become a re- reoccurring thing on the G- GSMC Sports podcast as well I'm hosting. Um, and we'll try to, like I said, you can apply this to teams, you can apply this to players, you can apply this to coaches, you can try this across different leagues, stuff like that. So, then it could be in the media, it could be in the future, it could be long term, it could be short term, stuff like that. So, we'll kind of debate that as we go forward. But, for the first one, we're going to start with NFL teams like heading into this 2020 coronavirus season. So, I'm going to have, I have two max three teams. I don't want to, like I said, I don't want to make the segment too, too long. But two, I'm going to have two teams for each side, and if I have the time, I'll, I'll, I'll address third for each side. So, um, we'll start with the bye. And my first team, I mean, this is a team that a lot of people, I won't be alone in this, a lot of people will believe that, there are a lot of people who do believe that they uh, think could be better this year. And that's the Arizona Cardinals. Obviously, you got Kyler in the second year. Got Cliff in the second year, so again, teams generally tend to, especially quarterbacks, and and as they get more acclimated to the league, they should become more comfortable. Cliff will become more com- comfortable with being a head coach. Uh, so he's still a rookie last year, and they still made decent strides for the end of the season. But again, still a rookie, still having some learning curves you have to get over. So you got that. You got also the potential second year jump. I mean, obviously, he's going to be the prime or most common candy, just kind of like Baker was last year, where he's going to be the guy everyone expects to take that big jump in year two, and maybe he will, maybe we won't, we'll see how that goes, but again, you have the second year thing where every year for the past, since, I guess from a quarterback perspective, since Carson Wentz in 2017, the last three years has been a second year quarterback that's taken the lead by storm, obviously Wentz then won the MVP, though that's... I mean that's um, contra- I mean not controversial per se, but it, he should have won it if his injury if he was hurt for the first three games as well as the last three he wins it with the same numbers. It's it's kind of weird the way that went down, but it is what it is. Um, so yeah, so like you have him, then you have obviously you have Mahomes doing what he did, and then you have Lamar Jackson last year. So he's a prime candidate for that second year jump in terms of like I said with the quarterback play. Added DeAndre Hopkins to an offense that probably, I know they drafted some receivers last few years, but probably could use another receiver, or definitely, not going to say probably, definitely could use a a real number one receiver on the outside, and now they have that with DeAndre Hopkins. Obviously, they got to get on the same page, because it would be weird um, with no real training camp or offseason to kind of work through things, but DeAndre Hopkins has been good, as we've talked about, with Larry, every quarterback he's played with, so I'd be shocked if Kyler Murray was the one guy that he couldn't put up Decent numbers, but that would be crazy to me. So you got that. You got Fitzgerald in his last year. You're probably going to want to try to send him out good. You got, on the defensive side, you got potentially um, Patrick Peterson trying to ball it in what is like a sort I think it's a contract year for him. I know he they're trying to work out, or he wants them to work out an extension this offseason, but he said contract or no contract, he's, gonna, he's looking forward to having a great season. So you got that. Motivated players play better generally. You added Isaiah Simmons on the defensive side of the ball as well. One of my favorite players in the draft can literally do everything. So when you have a player like that, you can move him around. You can make it game specific. Yeah, game specific. You can make it matchup specific, and you can just like I said, you can with a player like that, you can do a lot of different things that makes your your defense harder to predict because you don't know where he's going to line up, and thus that means you don't know where everybody else is going to line up. So. That's important. So you got the you got them. Another team a lot of people have been high on, including myself, is the Broncos, who again, if Drew Locke is who people think he could be, or who I guess well John Elway and Vic Fangio, who caught some heat this week, he's lucky I didn't talk about him. Um, if they are who if they are who they or they think Drew Locke is who they drafted him to be, then. This team, this Broncos team, could be very dangerous, especially with now no real clear-cut second team in the AFC West, as normally was the Chargers every year, but with Tyrod or maybe Justin Herbert, um, who knows who that could be this year. So maybe the Broncos are trying to vie for that second spot, because again, the first spot's going to be held by the Chiefs for the foreseeable future. 
Um, but yeah, so you have you have them. You added um, you added Jerry Judy. You added KJ Hamler on, like I said, the offensive side of the ball. I also added Albert Okwiegwin, Okwinibinam, Alberto, his tight end from Mizzou. So added to that offense, also added Melvin Gordon to go along with uh, Philip Lindsay. So you got you got those you got those additions on offense. You you didn't let go of Justin Simmons. You traded for AJ Bouye, if I remember correctly. You traded for did they trade for Jarrell Casey too? I think from Tennessee. Let me just make sure I'm right about that. Yeah, you got traded to the Broncos. So yeah, you've added some more veteran guys to that defense. Hopefully, you can get a rebound year out of Bradley Chubb. I know his numbers weren't as good as they were his rookie year. So then, so yes, you got you got those additions, and then, like I said, if Drew Locke is who you say he is, or who they think he could be, now you're looking at something. Got the piece on offense, got the piece on defense, got a halfway decent head coach, and Vic Fangio. I know he's at least a good defensive coach. And again, he's another guy who, in the second year, maybe can make improvements, and also got Pat Shermer for as offense coordinator, I believe. So he may not be a good head coach, but he Daniel Jones did look good last year. Um, from outside of the fumbles, like he he made strides throughout the year. So you, and he is and he was great for Case Keenum. Like him working and not just an offense may be fine. So I said you gotta you got those guys, so that could potentially work out for you. Then on the flip side, on the sell, because I think I'll I'll save my uh, third team. I'll leave you guys guessing on who that could have been. So on the sell side, there's a couple teams. I mean, I want to put the the Packers and Vikings at a tie, but I think I'm going to just, because I think both these teams are, I mean, I, I as I mentioned, I feel like the Packers greatly overachieved to become 13-3 and three and didn't really make too many improvements to that roster. Though, division, still a little, not the best division in football. So you got that, and then, but I'm going to go Vikings just because I got to see what that offense looks like with Adam Thielen and then just a bunch of guys. I don't want to say a bunch of guys, so you obviously have Justin Jefferson with the first round pick, but a bunch of unproven guys, I guess I should say. And no Kevin Stefanski. I mean, he worked wonders with Kirk Cousins last year, but it's a new offensive coordinator. Who is their, who is their offensive coordinator now? That's a good question. I know you didn't ask it, but I'm asking to myself. So... Vikings offensive coordinator. Don't know who that is, but like I said, so you lost Kevin Stefanski. Gary Kubiak. Is it Gary Kubiak? Or the John... Who is there? Oh, Gary Kubiak. Okay, it is Gary Kubiak. It's all right. A little bit similar. A lot of the um, stretch runs, a lot of play action stuff. I mean, he did one as with Matt Schaub, so... And I think he was also there with... Was he there with... Was He He was there with Peyton Manning in, 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 with Denver, I believe, right? Yeah, you have to look up Gary Kubiak's Wikipedia. Um, but yes, you got that. But like I said, you lost, you lose the Fon Diggs. So you got to see how that goes. Lose your offensive coordinator. You got to see how that goes. Lose, you lose Everson Griffin on defense line, though in theory he could come back. You lost Xavier Rhodes. I mean, some people may call it a positive move. But you got a lot of young guys at the receiver position. And you got a lot of young guys at the corners. And not just asking for a recipe for disaster. Even at safety with Anthony Harris, I know they franchise tagged him. They were talking about potentially trading him. So who knows how that could potentially work. Oh, yeah, he was the... Okay, yeah, he was the head coach in Denver, I believe, when uh, when uh, Peyton Man was there. I just have to double-check double um, Gary Kubiak, that was. So, yeah, so you got, you got some additions that they... You got some key guys that they lost that you got to try to figure out, or I want to try to see at least how they're going to replace them. Because as of right now, a lot of question marks. You look along that roster, a lot of question marks. So you got to see how that's going to work. And so I'll leave the pack of this one. But my other team is going to be the Titans, only because while they still could probably be good enough to win a division, because that division, AC South, probably isn't going to be great. Texans are going to be worse. Who knows what the Jags are going to be. And then who's the other team? Okay, so you got Jags. Titans, Texans, Colts? Yeah, I think it's Colts. And, I mean, 
who knows? Like, I feel Rivers was not that great last year. So I don't just expect him to turn it on, though. He does have a better offensive line this year. I mean, the weapons are maybe a little bit worse because, I mean, outside of T.Y. Hilton, unless I'm missing somebody, unless I'm forgetting somebody, who does he have on the outside? No, they drafted, no, they drafted Pittman, right? They drafted Michael Pittman, I believe. Yeah, so I think I think they drafted him. So, again, that could potentially help. Yeah, they drafted Michael. Oh, and they drafted Jonathan Taylor. Okay. That will help, even though they had Marlon Mack. Like, their running game was not the issue. But Jonathan Taylor could put up good numbers if they give him the lead back role. But, again, um, it's more, this is more so just a Philip Rivers thing in terms of how good the division could be. But, again, not talking about the Colts. Talking about the Titans. Um, but, yeah, so my thing with them is they're not going to take the league by storm again. Like, Ryan Tannehill was a big surprise last year. But people will be expecting it now. Granted, you still got to stop Derrick Henry, and that's easier said than done. But they're going to be prepared. They're going to be more prepared. I feel like teams are going to be more prepared for that coming in now. You're not going to be able to sneak up on teams. Like even as they were starting to get better, people were still like, "Oh, it's just the Titans, just the Titans." And then, like I said, they won. They won two playoff games. Got the AFC Championship game. Kept it close for a little bit, but then obviously the Chiefs were going to do going to do Chiefs things. But I'm saying I just don't see them like all right. So then, what's an improvement for them? Getting back to the AFC Championship, winning the Super Bowl, or getting to uh, not winning, getting to the Super Bowl. Like I just don't see that for them now. It may be a smaller drop than I'm predicting or thinking about, not predicting, but thinking about with like the Vikings or the Packers. Even though, like I said, I didn't mention the Packers, we didn't talk about the Packers in this segment, but just I don't think their drops gonna be as big. But I still think like they're not going to be. In the Super Bowl next year. I don't think. Could very well be wrong. And Titans fans, if you think I'm going to be wrong, please let me know. But I would be shocked if they were in the Super Bowl next year. Just put it that way. And I'm just saying that that's the only way they can go up. Like, anything else is a downward, is, is down from there. So unless I think the Tennessee Titans, unless you think the Tennessee Titans are going to the Super Bowl, then I feel like you might want to sell that stock a little bit. Just personally. So like I said, and they lost Logan Ryan, too, uh, who was maybe their best corner last year. That's that's definitely going to hurt a little bit. Um, and, I mean, like I said, you had Daniel who played very well last year. But there's, I mean, he's been a journeyman to a degree for a reason. And maybe that was just because he wasn't able to stay healthy. Maybe that's because he had Adam Gates as the coach. All reasonable um, beliefs. But they also lost Jack Conklin, who I think is going to be not the easiest guy to replace. I know they drafted Isaiah Wilson from Georgia in the first round, but you can't just expect him to plug in and play there right away. Also, they I know they drafted Christian Fulton, who can maybe help make up for the loss of, of of Logan Ryan, but, I mean, it's a rookie. You really don't know. And then the rest of there, they only had, like, they didn't really have that many other draft picks. So, I thought they were able to add a whole, whole lot to this team. Um, so, yeah, like I said, you have Derrick Henry, who's still going to be great. You have a good head coach, I believe, in Mike Vrabel, so there's still that. But I'm just saying, unless you think they're going to get back to where they were, if not better, which I don't think is going to happen, they may very well win the division again. But I don't think, oh no, they didn't win the division. The Texans did, right? Yeah, the Texans won the division. So you, they may win the division because their division is not going to be that great this year. But I can't see them even getting to where they got to last year. So. Because, I mean, hey, maybe maybe I should be on the Ryan Tannehill train. I'm not right now, but maybe I should be. And maybe I'll be proven wrong by him and say that, like, look, he just needed a stable home with a good offense built around him. And that's all I needed to succeed. But, again, you've seen guys play good for short periods of time. You've seen guys play good for even one season and then go back to who they were before that. Happened with Case Keenum, who's great with the Vikings, went to Washington, and has been kind of hit or miss, depending on the game. Playing the Eagles, though, it looks great. Um, but but just regular other teams, and eh, not so much. So, it's one of those things where you, like, I want to believe in Derrick Henry and Mike Vrabel, but Ryan Tannehill, he just gives me a little bit of pause. Not a lot, because he looked very good last year, and I like A.J. Brown and some of the other players they have on their team. Uh, Jeffrey Simmons, who played through a whole season, in theory, this year. Harold Landry, I like too. Like, so they have players I like, but it's just that like, I just don't see them being a Super Bowl contender. And like I said, they were in the AFC Championship game. So, unless you think they're going to elevate, I would sell that stock. But that's just me. 
So, like I said, this is a, a segment we could do f- moving forward. If you guys like it, let me know. If not, then I'll find something else. But I, I at least like this because it just, like I said, it can apply to anything. So, I'm gonna not gonna say I'm gonna do it on the next episode, but it, this will be at least for the time being a one that I might go to. Um, again, pretty soon. So, keep an eye out for it. But that'll do it for me here today on the GSMC Sports Podcast, presented by. GSMC Podcast Network. I want to thank you guys for listening, as always. Um, if you're going to be out there protesting, by all means, I'm staying with you. Power to the people. But the Ron is still out there, so be safe. Wear a mask, and also um, police and law enforcement been a little confrontational with certain people. Not everybody, but have been confrontational with certain people, so, so stay safe. Um, try to um, avoid any confrontation. You don't want to be on video, because you've seen a lot of videos of them brutalizing protesters. You don't want to be the next one. I, I don't want to see any of you guys out there um, getting beaten down. That's not what, that's not what anybody should, would want. So, like I said, stay safe out there in the protests. And again, social distance as much as you can. At least wear a mask. At the very least, you can wear a mask. That'll be helpful. So, yeah. So, um, do that. And also, like I said, I'd like to give my shout-out to the essential workers every episode. So, doctors, nurses... Grocery store workers, delivery drivers, people at the banks, mail delivery people, anybody that's been deemed essential during this pandemic, shout out to you. You've been helping keep, I mean, you've been helping keep everything going. You've been risking getting the disease to make sure people like me don't, because we don't have to leave our house as much as we would. Um, and you're around people who may not be social distancing properly, wearing a mask, so you're always putting yourself at risk. Shout out to you. Because you don't have to be doing that, but again, your work, if it's not appreciated by anybody else, is appreciated here by me. And also, shout out to the people that have been able to open back up their bars and restaurants. So the waiters, waitresses, bartenders, make sure you tip them. It'd be nice. They've been through a lot, just like we've all been through a lot. So if you see them, and like I said, I don't, I'm not 100% for giving everybody a extravagant tip. If they don't do good service, but they've been doing good service, give them a little extra. Like I said, they've been they've been through a lot during this time, as we all have. So, if you can, please do that. But yeah, um, uh, if you like what you've heard today, like what you've heard on other podcasts, please subscribe to the channel. Make sure you never miss an episode. Make sure you're always on top of when we drop our latest stuff. Also, if you could please as well, give us a five-star rating, write a nice review. We'd very appreciated. Very helpful. I'll see you guys. Allow us to see what you guys like. Dislike, enjoy, approve of, all that fun stuff that we know is going to help us get better. And if you're on social media, we're on social media. So you can find us there, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We can talk, we can chat, we can debate, we can discuss, talk about Drew Brees. We can talk about players using their platforms to speak out. You can talk about the turn of the NBA. This is, we're getting one sport back sometime relatively soon. Obviously, it's still late July, so it's a ways away, but it's something. Um, we can... Talk about teams that you're buying and selling in the NFL. Anything sports related, anything, anything related. I'm willing to talk about what you guys. We're all willing to talk about what you guys. So reach out to us on social media. But I'll do it for me here today. I have been Chris Blades. That has been my time. And until next time. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast part of the golden state media concepts podcast network you can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com download our podcast on itunes stitcher soundcloud and google play just type in gsmc to find all the shows from the golden state media concepts podcast network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.